Okay, my friends, it's story time again. This time I would like to read you something called Nine O'Clock Feed, which I wrote earlier this year when I participated in the New York City Midnight Short Story Challenge, <clears throat> which is an annual event, and if you're a short story writer and you haven't participated, I highly, highly recommend it, because it's a real stretch. Each, heat, each round, they give you a different genre to write in, a different subject, a different character that you have to incorporate, a different time limit, a different word count, <clears throat> and uh, it's just, it's like a wonderful workshop. You also get feedback. For the first round this year, I was in a heat where we had to write the story in the genre of comedy, and our, we had to incorporate a character who was a working mother, and the subject of the story had to be instant fame. So, I give you nine o'clock feed. <clears throat> on the day of her first ever interview on CNN, Amy slid a nursing pad in a lacy cover designed by her wife, Nicolette, between each of her dark nipples and each bra cup. She tried various prototypes of the always pretty, not always absorbent covers over the last few weeks, and didn't feel quite as confident as Nicolette that this iteration would be the final one but her wife was so excited by the chance to post on social media about Amy wearing the pads on international television that Amy couldn't refuse her. She had also given in on the question of what top to wear. What is this? Nicolette had demanded as Amy assessed her outfit in the bedroom mirror. What is what? This blouse! You were there when I bought it. Nicolette shook her long auburn ponytail and stepped behind Amy, pulling the back of the blouse to cinch it tightly. You must show the form of your bosom, otherwise what is the point? Oh, right. Nicolette went to Amy's chest of drawers and bent over to dig around. Her emerald velour sweatpants hugged her rump perfectly. She was wearing a pair of the no-panty-line underwear she had designed. Big panties, big plans. Because she found thongs so offensive to women. They get so crispy, no? Who wants that? It was thanks to healthy sales of those undies that the couple had felt confident about having a baby, and also thanks to them that Nicolette was pursuing this new design idea. She sewed circles of stretch lace to circles of various weights of cotton jersey, leaving a gap for women to insert and disguise regular disposable nursing pads. Everything Nicolette touched became beautiful, Amy thought, not for the first time. She wondered again why she had been chosen to land such a catch. When Nicolette pulled a tight-fitting turquoise top out of the drawer with a flourish, saying, This one, oui? Amy was deep in a surge of love and answered, oui. Everton Christopher Grant III needed to leave his apartment in the next three minutes if he wasn't going to be late to do his first ever interview for CNN. But he was having trouble pulling himself away from his bathroom mirror. He didn't want to leave until he'd been able truly to see himself there. Well, not himself himself, but the self he was striving to fashion himself into. After finishing his journalism degree at Tulane, he'd moved north to get a job with the Boston Globe and take the elitist northern media establishment by storm. The job hadn't yet worked out. To be honest, he thought that saying, Grant, like Ulysses, would go a lot farther than it had. But he had landed work as a stringer for CNN, mostly doing recorded person-in-the-street interviews. Those always went well. He was from the South, after all. Charming. And most of the people, he'd learned not to say folks, turned out to be nice, ready to laugh, happy to give him some time and a soundbite-worthy piece of their mind. He'd started feeling less combative, less driven to have their faces in the mud, his foot on their backs, flying the flag of the despite-the-accent intelligence of the South. These days, he was more inclined just to enjoy his way up the ladder. Then, CNN had asked him to meet a professor from Harvard, a specialist on North Korea, and interview her live for the nine o'clock feed. Where will I meet her? He asked the scheduler on the phone. On the street. What? We'll play the street interviews you did yesterday, then throw to you for the live one. Everton's tongue was suddenly as dry as a cat's. Everton? Yeah, yes, awesome, and, um, she's okay with it? Seemed relieved, actually. Studios can be intimidating. Okay, then. Awesome. Just don't be late. Everton's father's mantra had always been, 
If you're on time, you're late. And Everton had grown to firmly believe it. But still he stood in front of his mirror, staring into his own brown eyes, looking for the serious journalist he knew he was. The more he searched, the more desperate he appeared. He tried one of his father's looks instead, the one that felt like it could squeeze blood from a stone. Ah, there. Everton left his bathroom and hit the street. Traffic was murder. Stuck on I-93, Amy watched the dashboard clock tick the time away. Her plan had been to park in her usual spot, pump and primp in the staff toilet, then do some relaxing breathing as she walked from her building to Harvard Yard. Rubbernecking drivers by a three-car pileup meant that she wouldn't achieve the full drain she desired. The traffic loosened up for a while after that, but then slowed again to a crawl for no apparent reason. There was nothing to look at, no crumpled fenders, no brawling drivers, not even road construction, just the usual view of low-rise rectangles stubbornly refusing to pass out of sight. So there might be no pumping at all, and she'd be hurrying during her walkover, not relaxing. It was a beautiful day, though. She could see the logic behind contrasting Harvard Yard under a blue sky with a discussion of yet another North Korean long-range ballistic missile test out over Germany. With a discussion of yet another North Korean long-range ballistic missile test out over Japan toward Hollywood. She locked her car and checked her watch. She was now out of time for anything but a pee. The phone in her bag bingled merrily as she left the building, and she quickly checked it in case anything was up with Maud, but it was a volley of tweets. Nicolette's campaign to get people looking at Amy's boobs on TV had begun. Amy told herself not to think about that. She silenced the phone, put it away, and began to jog. Her breasts weren't huge even when engorged. She'd always gone braless before having Maud, but now they bounced painfully. She'd borrowed one of Nicolette's silky bras for this occasion, and it had felt lovely until she started to pick up the pace. Immediately, she missed her yellowed nursing bras with their major coverage, their heavy engineering, their formidable fasteners. Amy crossed into the yard. She had succeeded in being about five minutes early, so she slowed to a walk, inhaling for four, exhaling for seven. She spotted the journalist next to a camera woman by a tripod, finger combed her short curls into place, and approached. The journalist seemed to be very young, with a look in his eyes that flickered between hello there and don't fuck with me. She stretched out her hand. Everton grasped the professor's freezing cold hand in his. She was nervous. His father would have redoubled his steely stare at such vulnerability, but Everton's heart warmed to the woman. His hand was icy, too. Great, he said. Great to meet you. Awesome. Okay, this is Martha. She'll just get the light and sound sorted out for us. If you could just stand here and I'll... Okay, does that look like what we said, Martha? The camera woman held up a thumb. Awesome. Okay. Sound. We'll just do a little chit-chat for a second, okay? Of course, the professor said brightly. She was very nice. Everything was going to be okay. Amy worried that this southern boy journalist would ask her only the most basic of questions and was pleasantly surprised by the level of understanding inhabiting his long vowels. Soon she was feeling much more comfortable, able to get to the heart of what she most wanted to say, which was that the U.S. was having a very hard time juggling its diplomatic goals with North Korea at the same time as its diplomatic goals with the rest of North Asia. Which is to say, keeping Japan and South Korea calm and also maintaining a strong position vis-a-vis -vis the PRC, considering... Wyatt's face just twitched. Their close alliance. And is this administration good at juggling? The journalist asked, his eyes strangely wide, unblinking. He had the look people get when they are trying mightily to control their gaze. Students were passing. Maybe he'd seen someone he knew. Who knows, Amy replied, feeling for him, hoping her answer could keep him focused. There's a major lack of transparency at play. We're used to that from North Korea, but now we have it at home as well. Nope, he didn't look focused or comfortable. He was nodding, but only automatically. Maybe whoever he'd seen was someone he'd slept with. Something rolled against her foot in the breeze. She looked down, take away cup. The journalist was asking a final question. On a scale of one to ten, as she lifted her head, she realized what else had just been in her field of vision. How nervous should Americans be, particularly West Coast Americans, 
A perfect dark circle of moisture was widening slowly, but oh so surely, across her left breast. About this latest missile test over Japan. She had to clear her throat to speak. They're not a threat till the bombs are loaded, she said. And then she and the journalist stared at each other in shared horror for a second before he snapped his face into a smile, thanked her, and turned to the camera to throw back to the studio. He remained still for some seconds, smiling fixedly. Then his face softened, and the camera woman relaxed. When he turned back to Amy, he looked like he was struggling to formulate something to say, but the camera woman stepped away from her tripod, unwinding a long, tie-dyed scarf from around her neck. She handed it to Amy. Amy thanked her as warmly as she could in her state of shock and arranged the scarf so that the ends were hanging down over her breasts. It smelled of patchouli. Nicolette hated patchouli. Oh, God, Nicolette and her thousands of followers. That looks good, said the young man. It even matches. I'm so sorry, said Amy. No, no, he replied, reaching over to squeeze her arm. Maybe it wasn't in the shot. Amy looked at the camera woman, who scuffed the pavement with the toe of a purple Doc Martin. It's okay, Amy said, getting ready to face the future. She bent down to pick up her bag. Well, said the very nice young man, at least we know not to be worried about those missiles just yet. Good luck to us all, Amy said to the world in general, and turned to go back to her car. Unlike Amy, Everton couldn't resist checking social media for any reaction to his interview with the unfortunate overflowing expert. It had taken mere minutes for someone to capture the relevant part of the video and edit in some flashing arrows around the expanding dark turquoise aureole. Hashtag, not a threat till the bombs are loaded. That hashtag trended only shortly, soon giving way to hashtag, not a threat till the boobs are loaded, and then hashtag, the boobs are loaded. That one stuck. Someone tried to get Everton's wide-eyed discomfort to go viral as well, with an ahuga horn sound effect, hashtag come to mama, but that one mercifully fizzled. It seemed there were fewer men childish enough to keep that one going than there were men. Wait, it wasn't men. It was women retweeting and reposting the video. Amy sat in her car outside her house and stared at her silent bag, knowing there had to be dozens of irate messages on her phone from Nicolette. She wondered if she should bite the bullet and read them then decided Nicolette would want to say everything in the messages all over again in person at least once. She took a huge breath and shouldered her bag. As she walked up the path to the house, she no longer felt the sunshine or the breeze. She braced herself for stormy weather indoors. The enthusiasm of Nicolette's welcoming hug when she opened the door rocked her back on her heels. Ah, oh, ma chérie, it's so wonderful! It is? Didn't you see? Yes, didn't you see? See what? Come, Maud is hungry. Amy dropped her bag and Nicolette pulled her by the hand into the bright kitchen. Maud was in her rocker, kicking her legs in excitement at seeing her mammary mommy. Nicolette's tablet was open to Instagram on the table. Next to it sat her laptop, open to Twitter. The leakage video was playing on both screens. Oh, Jesus, said Amy, this is not wonderful. It is, Nicolette crowed, unbuckling Maud. Sit, feed Maud. I will tell you. Amy pulled out a chair and sat, receiving Maud into her arms. She moved the scarf out of the way and lifted the turquoise top to reveal how the nursing pad had slipped down into the bra's underband. She pulled the cup away from her nipple and the snuffling Maud latched noisily on. The other nursing pad still in place was full. You are married to a genius, Nicolette said, her eyes, sp her eyes sparkling. I see your leaking bosom, and at first I think, oh, shit, no, 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 no. But what do I say always? Um, you can't have the butter and the butter money? No. Do I always say that? All the time. Oh, then the other thing I say. Help me out, I can't think. Every problem is an opportunity. Even this one? Especially this one. I think, I act. I post that you are in such an hurry, you put only the right pad, not the left pad, et voila, look what happens. Most people want to see, they watch, and they feel for you. Not the men, forget men. I also always say that, no? 
the women, Amy. The beautiful mothers. They feel for you, they feel for themselves, and everyone who has a leakage video is now sharing it. It's a shame hashtag me too is already taken, but hashtag the boobs are loaded is more powerful, don't you think? The relief at not having disappointed her spectacular wife flooded Amy's system and mingled with her nursing high to make her lose her sense of self. She looked down at Maud, who was growing fatter and creamier each day. Nicolette's voice sounded distant now, muffled by Amy's cocoon of contentment. Was his name Everton? the voice was asking. The one who interviewed you? He was nice, no? Chéri? He has sent a tweet. Can he interview us together? Tomorrow? A thousand apologies to my friends in the South and in France.